Today is July 1st, 2014, and this is episode 123. The following program is not an endorsement for any service, product, act, or anything. In the words of Arthur S. Falls, bury your money in the ground. It's the only safe thing to do. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice-weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. This episode, number 123, is the first since we've launched LTB Coin, and you'll find our very first LTB Coin sponsors during the first break of today's episode. To learn more about the LTB Coin Crypto Rewards Program, visit letstalkbitcoin.com and click the menu item LTB Coin. Sign up soon if you don't want to miss out. There are 2 million LTB coin being distributed this Friday to community members based on the articles they read, comments they leave, and how active you are in the forums. Make sure to sign up for an account at letstalkbitcoin.com and a wallet at counterwallet.co. With that out of the way, my name is Adam B. Levine. I'm the editor-in-chief here at Let's Talk Bitcoin, and today we're all about MasterCoin. Today on Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're joined by Ron Gross, Executive Director of the MasterCoin Foundation. Ron, how you doing? Pretty good. Uh, glad to be here. <laughs> it's been a while since we've actually talked. <laughs> yeah, I think the last time that we caught up on the MasterCoin project specifically would have been back in January at the Miami event where David Johnston was kind of speaking on behalf of MasterCoin. So, I mean, that that's like that's like five months ago. And in Bitcoin time, that's forever. Can you kind of bring us up to date on what, what's happened in that time? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I'll give you the, the headlines, right? And, and I think that a lot of people, you know, know some of these events, but it's it's good to summarize. So we, we've done a lot of work internally on on consolidation. We had, as the project started, uh, you know, for those of you who can remember, we had four different uh, implementations of, of the master protocol, just freelance developers working on, on bounties. So we've done a lot of consolidation. We got that down to two implementations, one implementation, Implementation. Now we're actually finalizing the standard implementation that is called Master Core, and that's going to be ready in, in just about a month. That's a really interesting way to approach this, doing it with bounties. I'm a big fan of bounties, and I'm wondering, now you're taking steps to consolidate. Do you think that this has been a good thing where you've had more variety to pick from and more, I mean, like that there's been competition? Or do you think that it would have been more effective to just start with one implementation rather than going the bounty route? I know a lot of people are thinking about this these days. Right. So, you know, it's been a super interesting learning experience for all of us, and we've had a lot of discussion about this internally, right? And we you know we don't always necessarily agree on the right approach, but you know I, I can tell you what I think, and I think that a lot of people would agree with me. the The bounty approach it's useful for some things. It needs to be managed very very carefully. But uh, I, I think that the way that we've done it, like, I wouldn't do it like that, right? I think that. We got four different people or teams working on competing projects, that, and we, we spent endless amounts of time on identifying and consolidating so-called consensus issues between different implementations. So, so a consensus issue is where the different implementations just disagree with each other, and because of that, they weren't compatible, right? So you have to reckon those things. Right. We actually have a consensus checker page. That's how one of the developers set up that constantly monitors all the different implementation. And then you could see, you know, exactly how much, how far along are we regarding consensus, right? If 98% of the balances agree, but, you know, 2%, if you go to a different implementation, you get a different answer regarding to how much master points uh, are there at that address. And that's not a good thing to have. So, you know, we, we did see a lot of useful edge cases brought up by the competing implementations, but overall, I think that progress is sometimes more important than adhering to a specific spec, right? You know, we, we because the, the way the project started, we had the spec written by JR, right? It was in, in, in text, in English. And then we had the implementations follow up and, and implement that. So, you know, if we had gone with one implementation, there may have been cases where that would have differed from the spec. But I, I argue that that's okay. Maybe there are cases where that's not always the case. Right? If someone could find a way to hack the spec, hack the, hack the protocol and steal all the coins, you know, that, that would be a catastrophe. But for mo most cases that we've seen weren't like that. They were just minor versions or interpretations of the same English sentences. Right? So it doesn't, at the end, it doesn't really matter which interpretation you pick as long as you have one and it's solid. 
that, that's that's my view. So one implementation to rule them all, so to speak. Yeah, and you know, it's it's perfectly fine to have other implementations uh, as well, but I think that we shouldn't focus on that. We shouldn't necessarily fund that. That they should maybe play catch up to us. If if somebody wants to write another implementation, we're not going to stop them. But it doesn't mean we need to always coordinate with them, always fund them. And, and the way that Bitcoin has evolved is sort of there are many lessons to be learned there as well, right? Because Bitcoin started with one single Satoshi reference implementation. Over time, it got a lot of different uh, implementation in many languages. But as far as I understand, and I've had a lot of talks with Peter Todd on the subject, then these implementations aren't actually in consensus, right? In Bitcoin itself, Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin D is the only reference implementation, and and other implementations just go into or get into fringe cases where you know it's really dangerous to rely on another implementation other than Bitcoin Core. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned there, and where we're taking these lessons and going back to the source, if you say if you would, uh, by, by actually forking Bitcoin Core into Master Core. Okay, so you're going to have to explain to me the significance of that. So you've taken Bitcoin Core and you're forking it into Master Coin Core. Is this something that happened several months ago? Is this something that's ongoing now? And what exactly does that mean? Does that just mean you're, you're starting with kind of a clean slate from where Bitcoin is? So the, the funny story here is that when that happened, that wasn't actually our initiative. We've, we've had these kind of talks in the, in, uh, you know, in the last uh, half a year. And you know we, we talked about reducing the number of implementations. Eventually, we, we defaulted to one of our implementations as the, the reference implementation. But it was you know it was written in Python. It has a it had the big big dependency list on uh, on Lib Bitcoin and and uh, Obelisk servers and and some rather esoteric tech that isn't really used in production that often. So we had a community developer, someone we didn't even know, approach us and say, Hey guys. Uh, Look at what I've done. I took Bitcoin Core, I forked it, and I added Master Coin on top of it. What do you think? When that happened, I actually didn't have that much time and attention to look at it because I was dealing with all you know the the four implementations that we had, right? So I told them, yeah, all right, it, it's nice, I like it, but you know we don't need yet another implementation. But after a while, we've had you know we we actually learned that. The, the implementations that we have weren't really that good or weren't really up to par. They had All of them had different problems, right? One implementation was sort of based on Bitcoin Core, but it had that as an external dependency rather than an integrated solution. And it was only available on Windows, right, which is a no-go for exchanges. The cross-platform implementation we had was, again, based on these dependency list, and exchanges just couldn't get that to work. Right, despite our best efforts. And this is, by the way, the reason why we're right now not on any exchanges, right? We've been talking to them for six months and then the tech was just not good enough. So, you know, once we sort of realized these lessons, we, we came back to Michael, this developer, and, and we basically gave him free reign to, to go and, and, you know, push this project and we made this the, the flagship or the, the reference implementation for Mastercore. And this is the process that we're, we've been working very heavily on in the last few months. And, and the release of that, again, is expected around August 1st, which is, uh, coincidentally enough, the birthday of Mastercoin. So you've gone from having four implementations, and you wound up not using any of those implementations, and are going with this clean implementation that's built on top of uh, Bitcoin Core. Hang on a second. So Bitcoin Core itself, though, is not a Windows-only process. You're saying the previous ones were Windows-only, and this one is cross-compatible, right? So again, we, ha we had multiple implementations. One of them was written in .NET and was Windows-only. Another one had those this weird dependency list and, and wasn't that usable in production. This one is Bitcoin Core. It's usable wherever Bitcoin is usable, right? And that's basically on every platform. That's, uh, you know, I'm excluding mobile here. It, it would not mean for people to run this uh, directly on mobile, but, you know, on Windows, on, on Mac, on Linux, uh, as command line versions. Uh, we will have the UI for that as well. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's going to fulfill, you know, that's going to be one implementation to rule them all. And we're integrating that into our uh, web wallet. That's the Omni wallet. So, you know, we, we won't have any discussions of, of any consensus issues anymore. And, you know, if, if, if other people want to 
again to fork this implementation or to, to code whatever they want in a custom in another, another programming language or environment they're free to do so of course but uh, you know we're not going to do that as, as an organization so it sounds like what you're telling me is you went from in the beginning saying to the community at large we don't necessarily know what the right thing is so let's come up with it together and you put out these bounties and you have this generate but now as time has gone on you've kind of had the experience that this took a lot of time a lot of resources and generated competitive but not actually that good work so you've you've basically refocused on a uh, first good solution and then once that good solution is out there then the expectation is people will start making fringe solutions based off of that good starting point right is that a good summary yeah you know we don't really need uh, to people to to fork off that you know people can use various methodologies to to integrate the core offering but there will be an obvious best choice for almost every user as opposed to now or as opposed to previously where there were several choices you had to actually look at and decide between Right, and that's that's the core, you know, master core. That's 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 the standard. Now, I want to to add a point here that a lot of this uh, approach uh, of how we develop things, you know, it started really back in August or September. Well, I think that some of that was uh, spurred off of uh, ide ideology, right? We wanted uh, we wanted to have the community to really build whatever they want to, to fit the spec. We didn't want to direct that too much. We were, you know, building a decentralized organization and, and we didn't want to have the authority. Uh, we actually liked the fact that there were a few implementations out there, but, uh, and, and it's all nice goals to, to reach for. But at the end of the day, you know, execution speed suffers a lot from that. And, and that's really important in this space. One of the other things that's kind of interesting that MasterCoin has done, you know, MasterCoin has had funds where most other projects have not. And even where some other projects have had funds, like BitShares, they haven't really done so much of a broad-scale bounty program and more of just used it to fund, like, bringing developers in-house and stuff like that. So I'm kind of curious, can you talk about role-based bounties? And I know we had a staffing shakeup in MasterCoin a couple of months ago. I mean, like, it, that, that seems like just a fascinating project. Can you explain role-based bounties to people and how that worked for you? Right, so this is, again, part of the evolution that we've gone through in the last half a year or more, right? We, we started the project, uh, JR bounties out there, and they were very generic. You know, uh, you know, if you code the, the first implementation of uh, of Mastercoin, you get uh, some amount, or you know, there is a contest that, that everybody who participates wins. There are some some benefits to these models, right? It's it's really open to everybody to do something, and everybody who does something towards this effort wins. But there wasn't really clear guidance, and and that resulted in all these implementations that the multiple implementation problem that I spoke of. So alongside with consolidating the implementation, we also consolidated the organization. Right, so right now we were built a lot more like a traditional startup, right? We, we hired Craig, our CTO, I think around uh, February, and, and really built an internal team structure, right? We have a team working on the web wallet. We have a team working on the core project. The team have, you know, people leading the teams, they're reporting to Craig, and, and it's working, you know, we have, month, we have uh, weekly meetings. It's really a lot, a lot like uh, GitHub or any sort of decentralized startup, but with people who are actually on the payroll, so to speak. So this is actually the role-based bounties. We came up with the concept of uh, role-based bounties where, you know, we had a bunch of coders working and we wanted to get some of them to quit their day jobs and then come spend more time on MasterCoin. So, you know, th these coders didn't want to make that jump based on, on bounties alone, because bounties are very situational, right? One month you do great, you get a, a great uh, bounty, the next month, uh, I don't know, somebody else uh, takes some of that money and then you're left, you know, you need to, f to feed your family or, or pay your rent. So, you know, we, we just made, a, made, made this uh, concept called a role-based bounty, where you get a role, uh, and you know we trust you to fulfill this role. It's a, it acts as a sort of a minimum bounty amount for that month, right? If you if you're a role-based bounty, you get a minimum of six thousand yeah, US dollars uh, for that month. And in addition, you can also you know if you do work that is valued by the community as as being worth more than that bare minimum, then you get extra. 
right? But you have that base level of assurance and, and you know, you can quit your job, you can come work for us full time. Well, so that's that's been very, very helpful for us. So is that how you've continued doing things? So, so basically before you just had a bunch of different people who were doing these roles and now you have fewer people, but you're still using role-based bounties or have you guys walked away from role-based bounties for the time being? No, no, we're, we're using role-based bounties and you know, we have a core team of about uh, 12 people give or take and you know they're all they all have their own individual roles you know we have biz dev people we have you know web developers we have like, core developers and they're all doing what what they were hired to do basically Hey everybody, today I'm happy to present you with our first two LTB coin patrons. If you'd like to use your LTB coin to sponsor the show, visit letstalkbitcoin.com and click the sponsor and spend button on the menu. It's a manual process right now, but you'll get some screaming deals too. Also, please note that sponsor time is not an endorsement. I'm just telling you about them as best I can figure it. With a high bid of 12,100 LTB coins submitted seconds before the close, bitcoinmegaphone.com is our first LTB high watermark. So what is Bitcoin Megaphone? Think Twitter meets billboard advertising. From the front page, you're able to easily create a post from which you'll be asked to pay 0.00001 Bitcoin per character for however long the message is. Once the message is posted, it can receive tips which then belong to you. To try it out, I wrote a 229 character post which included a link and very easily I was able to specify where I wanted my tips to go pay the 0.00229 BTC, about a buck fifty for my CryptoKit wallet, and the post was live and big on their front page. Anyone can post as much as they'd like, and content is completely uncensored, so browse at your own risk. Although when I looked at it this morning, it did seem fine. For people looking for a platform completely free of gatekeepers and asking very nominal fees, check out bitcoinmegaphone.com. Episode 123's second patron is Bitmain, coming in at 12,000 LTB. Bitmain designs Bitcoin ASICs in the Antminer line. In our conversation, they really emphasize that they don't accept pre-orders and they wait to sell their product until it's ready to ship, which is something that I personally really appreciate. So with that in mind, they're trying to get the word out about their new unit, the Antminer S3. It's a 28 nanometer part and offers a 20% power savings compared to the 55 nanometer chips that they were using previously. The mining unit itself is pretty small, about the size of a big loaf of bread. It's also supposedly very quiet with custom heat sinks and fans mounted on both the front and the back of the unit. Each unit claims to deliver up to 478 gigahashes per second while consuming 366 watts of electricity, and each unit costs about 0.75 Bitcoin. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit bitmaintech.com. And if you'd like to become a patron on the LTB network, visit letstalkbitcoin.com and click the menu item Spend and Sponsor. Back to the show. So, Ron, now that you've phrased yourself as a startup, I get to ask the question, how long is your runway before you need to raise more capital to keep operating at your current rate? Right. So we have about 3000 bitcoins in our uh, uh, war chest. Uh, and all of that is, is you know, public. It's uh, all our ledger is public uh, from day one. Uh, so that's uh, just under two million dollars. The runway that gives you is about, uh, I think, about 10 months. Uh, you know, the, the valuation keeps changing with the Bitcoin price. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we're, we're, most of us are bullish on Bitcoin prices. We think that they're going to increase. And, and with that, the valuation of the war chest will increase and allow us to, to continue uh, further. But that's the runway that we already have given the current market trends. And, you know, we do have some other, let's say, let's call them mitigation strategies or extension strategies on, on how to extend that. But that's not really something I want to get into in, in this call. We haven't actually talked about this yet, but MasterCoin at its core, for anybody who's been listening to this point and hasn't, hasn't, uh, isn't aware of this, MasterCoin allows the creation of user-created assets and it allows for a couple of other uh, kind of base level services, like you, you have contracts for differences. Um, what have I missed? Right. So, you know, we... It's. I'd like to to really outline the vision and and what we have right now. Please. Right. So the vision we started was was very uh, sort of grand. We we listed a bunch of things on our white paper, and you know we had the contract. I think contracts for differences actually came later, but you know we we had issuing of smart property tokens or custom currencies. We had self stabilizing currencies. We have safe addresses or saving addresses. Oh, and of course the the distributed or decentralized exchange. 
that allows you to trade all these assets and contracts without going to a centralized exchange. So this is, you know, this is what we're building, and and right now, you know, we've done parts of that, but we still have a lot, a long way to go until we implement uh, all, all that. And Master Core is going to give us the the right platform to build on top and add, add these features. You know, we've, we sort of had a feature freeze for the last few months while we're refocusing uh, all these implementations. So what we have right now as our core uh, offering, we have the descent between Bitcoin and MasterCoin, right? That, that's operating. You can purchase MasterCoins with Bitcoins and you don't need to go through any central uh, clearinghouse or exchange. You can issue custom currencies right now Today, it's still, you know, you need a script for that. It's, it's, you need to be technical. Uh, I think within a week from today, so around the early start of July or end of June, we'll have a web page that basically lets you do that by yourself. You won't need to talk to anybody from the MasterCoin team to issue a, a currency. Of course, we have the web wallet and, and desktop wallet that, you know, allows you to, to hold these currencies and send them and, and all the normal features. Next features up our sleeves will be, well, one of them is, it, it's, it's called dividends in the popular language. We're, we're actually trying to shy away from that and, and just call it pay to all because dividends has a, a legal baggage and the, the area is, uh, that area is a bit tense there right now or unclear. And of course, after that, we'll have the distributed exchange to allow trading with, with all these currencies, right? We're going to have tens of, of different uh, user assets and currencies on the platform. Some of them will be big, like, like MadeSafe uh, and, and will be traded on exchanges. Others will be, you know, perhaps too small to, that central exchanges won't want to list them, but the beauty is that you don't need to go to a central exchange. You can just trade the assets on the decentralized exchange. Even if you know you're just doing a, a coin for your for your community, for your city, for something that's too marginalized to be on an exchange. So one of the first applications of those uh, custom currencies that you were talking about that we saw was MadeSafe's token, which actually isn't MadeSafe's coin. It's their like pre-coin, right? Can you can you talk to us about how that project came about? Right. So. They're actually calling the coin that they have right now, they're calling that made safe coin. And, and you're right, it, it is sort of a pre-coin. Right now it's, it's, it, it's an asset that, is, or that will be transferable to another coin called SafeCoin that will be launched in, in the future of this year or for, following this year. Basically, MadeSafe is a startup there in Scotland. They've been working for the last eight years on building a decentralized internet. Right? And they're decentralizing every aspect of, of the internet that we know of, if it's uh, storage or compute power or, or bandwidth. You know, one, one clear example of this is, you know, that I always use is a decentralized Dropbox. Right? Uh, companies like Dropbox and, and Google and Microsoft that host your files in the cloud, they have very expensive servers. And you actually end up paying these companies a lot more than, than you would uh, in, in the comparative case of MadeSafe or and peer-to-peer -peer storage. So how, how does peer-to-peer -peer or decentralized storage works? Uh, you basically it's on your own computer and you send them to people in your vicinity, right? And then, of course, the software does that for you automatically. You don't need to actually go about encrypting, decrypting, sending that. But uh, the, the concept is that instead of storing it in a big, expensive data center, you just store it with other people. Everybody has terabytes of free space on their hard drives just laying about there doing nothing. And the same is true for compute power, for, for bandwidth, right? If you're, if you're at a conference, if you're traveling, you don't have your, your Wi-Fi, and you don't, you know, if you buy, if you buy Wi-Fi, or sorry, if you buy 3G from your cellular provider, you're gonna pay a fortune. But the people on the street next to you, they have free Wi-Fi that costs them nothing. So they can share that, earn a few coins on the side, and, and you get your service. This is the vision that MadeSafe is working towards. They have been operating uh, or developing for the last eight years. They had uh, different uh, business models uh, in mind then. Some of them uh, involved charging a percentage of the fees or other models. What they have come up with is actually a mutation of that model into a completely decentralized model. So the MadeSafe company is going to deflate all of its air or, or value and all that value is going to flow into a decentralized economy that is built around made safe coins and safe coins. So holders of safe coins 
will be able to use them to, to pay for these services, but when they use them, they only pay to the person who they, they're buying the service from. And then that person doesn't need to be made safe the company. It can be anybody next door. And, and the business model that MateSafe is basing on is that the technology isn't, you know, isn't complete now, right? They only started working on this transformation to the centralized network uh, you know, based on, on cryptocurrency and, and blockchain technology only this year. So the technology right now isn't developed. People could invest and can still invest and speculate on, on how well they will be doing and how, how mature their technology is and, and buy these coins you know, right now off the market. And as their technology matures and, and gets deployed in various products and, and the ecosystem grows and they actually have a bunch of sub-applications that are going to be built on top of it. So as this ecosystem grows, the coins are just going to get more and more useful and so their value will rise. And this is a template that we're seeing a lot more. You've, you have a LTB coin, you have a city with Tatiana coin, there are a lot of other coins there right now that are following this model where you have a token, the token is used uh, or is, is pre-sold for, for some promise or idea of a, of a future service. As then, and, and then as that service gets implemented and delivered, the coins uh, get more valuable. And if in some cases that service doesn't end up getting delivered or, or something happens, then the coins won't be worth that much. It's a way for people to, to invest in ideas that they believe in. You know, main safe, depending on how you look at it, has been wildly successful, but some people think that it's like a scam. And it's a weird conversation to have with them a lot of times, too, because, you know, because people will say things like, you know, they just took the money and ran. And that's clearly not what happened. Clearly, they they are actually working on the thing in Scotland now that they have the money. Once you get the money, that doesn't instantly mean the product is developed. That just means now you have the ability to potentially develop it. it too, there were some problems that popped up in the in the MadeSafe campaign, you know, which is, of course, to be expected as it was I think the first crypto crowdfunding event that used its own token, right? Well, other than uh, Mastercoin uh, itself, right? But, right, uh, right. Yeah, the, 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 the first, first user-created asset, I guess you might say. Right. Yeah, the, the first one that uses used another underlying platform for the issuance. First of all, I just want to get one one word out of, out of our lexicon uh, immediately, and that's that's scam. I know there are scams. There are going to be scams, as you know this yourself. You know, people will always accuse people, uh, other people in companies. Uh, when you know things don't go uh, as as you know as as they want, or or when uh, you know things may, may be taking a, a bit uh, longer than anticipated, it, people have been accusing you know Bitcoin and Bitcoiners of being a scam for years. That doesn't automatically make it so. So yeah, the case with MateSafe uh, is they had a, a big a big uh, crowd sale. They raised the money. They're at their you know they're out there uh, developing the, the software. They released their first test net already. So there's definitely progress there, but it's definitely not a scam. And, and I know that they're, they're progressing. They have a bunch of developers. I don't remember the exact amount of I think it's hundreds of developers interested in, in developing on top of MateSafe. I, I had a call today with, with one company who's, who's building something on top of them. And they're clearly on track and delivering or working on delivering. Regarding the crowd sale itself, as it was the, the first crowd sale, yeah, we, we did have uh, you know unanticipated issues there. And we actually wrote full retrospective on the matter, and then we you know we, we analyzed uh, how the crowd sale went, how it was planned, what we did right, what we did wrong, and I think it's very important as, as these are the early stages of, of cryptocurrency in general, and I know these you know crowd sales or 2.0 protocols. Uh, it's important that all of us instead of just going and, and flaming everybody who fails. Let's just be together as a community and, and try to learn and, and help each other move forward. On, on that specific occasion, on the native crowd sale, the, the summary is that you know, while in the weeks going up towards the crowd sale, you know, we had a lot of discussions with them and we also tried to estimate how, how much funds are going to flow in. And you know, we, we thought uh, they were aiming at raising $8 million. We thought that, yeah, maybe they could raise that in, in 30 days. We're not sure. We, we, let's see how that happens. And end up getting that to that amount, that number in five hours. So, you know, before even people woke up in the States, there was such a huge demand because it was the first crowd sale, uh, again, after the MasterCoin crowd sale. 
So yeah, there was a lot of anticipation there. A lot of people, you know, hope to make a quick buck. They hope to to leverage arbitrage differences, and and you know some of them didn't make that. Everybody who sent money to the fundraiser either got made safe coins, or if they were past the deadline, I know that their money got returned. But uh, some people bought master coins in anticipation, and and you know they didn't go to invest in master coins or using master coins, and actually. Right now, most of the crowd sales that are happening, I think that they're not they're not taking master coins directly, but rather they're just using Bitcoin for the crowd sale, and, and most of them are investing in master coin with the Bitcoins that they raise in order to support the platform that they're working on. So th this is a, perhaps the healthier model where there is no dual issuance. You don't pre-commit to a, a specific rate. And, and you know this is all even this new model it's, it's still new there are still crowd sales going on right now with this model and then we're adjusting it together uh, i expect uh, the whole market to be a lot healthier and a lot more educated in six to 12 months but anybody anybody going to participate in a crowd sale you know these days they need to understand that they're they're pioneering they're, they're pioneering bitcoin they're pioneering uh, the space it's like you know, trying to, um, you know, 2010, your, your computer could crash, the, the, your coins could be lost and you, you, you'd have nothing you can do about it. So we're maybe not at that early stage because you know, we, are, we are building on, on some proven technology here and not inventing everything from scratch and when we just keep learning and improving. CryptoKit is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com. Earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that you're avoiding the word uh, dividend because it has kind of legal connotations and using this pay to all uh, nomenclature instead. You know, one thing I've noticed about a lot of the a lot of the upcoming crowd sales that are getting talked about is that they're kind of light on information. Uh, a lot of them are pretty light on information. And I, it strikes me that is, does this have anything to do with like the kind of questionable legal environment that we're in? Do you think that that's causing people to hold back and be more conservative with what they will tell people? I actually have. I haven't seen that. I don't think that's not a conclusion that I would draw. I think that you know uh, some people just invest more in, in preparing their their homepage or the, their crowd sale pages, while others just put up a general idea and, and, and recruit based on that. So we're watching you know the thousand flowers bloom. None of them necessarily know about each other. They're just doing their own thing, and this is just the environment that happens. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know we, we uh, of course uh, serves as a focal point for all these uh, or, or for some of these companies uh, doing crowd sales, and uh, you know we we try and help them with the best information that we. Can. Can. We're compiling guides or collecting resources. We have a crowd sale guide, you know, how to do crowd sale on, on the master protocol. And that's it's a living document, right? We keep updating it as we have more information. But my advice to anybody who, who's doing a crowd sale is, of course, talk to your lawyer to understand that what you're doing is legal. We don't facilitate or, or advocate any, any legal activities. And, and, and once you've done that, Put everything up on the web page. I mean, there's no limiting or, or hiding information. Won't uh, I don't think that will, that's what's going to save you from from the SEC or from FinCEN or from, from the authorities, right? Doing the right things, like consulting with your lawyers, is something that can help you uh, avoid the nasty situations. You mentioned that sales on the MasterCoin platform aren't accepting MasterCoin, but that the campaigns that are successful are investing some of the Bitcoins they get into MasterCoin. That sounds weird to me. Can you talk to me about that? Right. So the platform that we have, you, you can accept whatever currency you want, right? Right now, we actually still have that technical limitation where only MasterCoin and other MasterCoin-based currencies are, are accepted, but you can always do that manually or with scripts or with, with sites like uh, CoinPowers and Swarm that facilitate that for you. So, you know, at the end of the day, you can dictate whatever policies you want and accept whichever currencies you, you want to accept. Now, 
it's it's very hard to, to price these, right? All these all these new currencies, including Mastercoin, is very volatile. So if you simultaneously accept both Bitcoin and Mastercoin in your crowd sale, that, that could be chaos, like it like it was actually in, in MadeSafe, right? You could expect one one setting, and then you know a week after you have another. People will ba basically take advantage of arbitrage and play against you. What we are seeing more and more issuers do, they accept Bitcoin because keep it simple stupid right that's the most simple thing you can accept in a crowd sale is bitcoin as part of as for supporting mastercoin and buying mastercoins after the crowd sale you know people want to make sure that they are operating on a platform that is sustainable right they want to make sure that you know we, people will be available that the platform will be available that if they have any feature requests or changes that they want to implement later uh, you know there will still be a foundation and that ties into the question you asked before about the runway for the foundation right so when i counted the runway and our, our resources i only counted the bitcoins that we have but we all we, all, we also have master coins that are continuously being generated at our address at our exodus address so that's you know that's a decaying rate it's not an infinite amount it's very limited capped and, and well known but it is a sort of source of uh, financial uh, assets that we have that we can leverage to to motivate developers and to fund development. Nobody has to do anything. Nobody has to buy master coins or to pay us anything. The platform is completely open. I want to really stress out this point because there are, there have been a lot of misconception here. You don't. You can do a crowd sale. You can raise ten million dollars and not pay us a dime and not accept any master coin. Right? It's completely open. However, if you raise ten million dollars and and operate on a platform. You probably do want to make sure that the platform is around six months from now, 12 months from now, and you want to, to stay in the loop. You, maybe want, you may want to influence how the platform evolves. For that, it just makes sense for you to own some master coins. But again, it's, it's the, the decision of, of whether and how much to own is, is completely up to you. Okay, cool. That actually makes more sense to me. Has anybody decided to do this yet? Do you have any commitments yet from projects? Did MadeSafe do this? MadeSafe did that, and I, I know that right now, I think that all or most of the projects that are, are working on the master, porn, or master protocol are, are doing that. Uh, I know that API Network is doing that, and uh, GeneraCoin, I think they're doing that. It's less of a matter of a commitment, right? Because they're not signing any contracts with us, but more of like a plan that they present to their investors, right? They're, they say, yeah, well, we're gonna, we plan to raise this amount of money, this much will be used for development, this much for marketing, and this much will invest back into the master protocol. And this investment, you know, it's not, it's not a donation, right? They, they get master coins, and, and as we get a critical mass of, of these issuances, you know, the platform just becomes a lot more usable than the value of MasterCoin should rise. So recently, I have seen that you guys have been having an internal conversation about what, you know, should drive the price of MasterCoin and if you should do something to, to mm -hmm. put more value into it. Because you're saying on the one hand here that uh, that people don't need to use MasterCoin. So I understand why a company that's using the platform would want to keep the foundation around if it's providing real benefit to them. But um, how does this work in general? About the the use of MasterCoin within the Master Protocol. Back back when we started, we, we sort of had these little places where we, we enforced the use of MasterCoin in the protocol, right? To do a crowd sale uh, automatically on the platform, you could only accept MasterCoin. You can't accept Bitcoin or, or well, you can accept any MasterCoin derived currency, but you can't accept just pure Bitcoin, right? And and that's you know something that we're still carrying with us as uh, but we will be you know we already agreed that this will be resolved and changed, that right? you, you can do a crowd sale, you can accept Bitcoin. And the goal here is really to stay competitive and make sure that people have no artificial barrier to entry, right? So they can just do a crowd sale, get the money that they need, get the services that they need. On the other hand, there are a few places where it really makes technical sense to require master points, right? Regarding this uh, dividend or pay to all feature, for example, right? If you have, if you're sending tokens, to all the people who hold, you know, X coins. That can be a very large operation from a technical standpoint, right? You can have a thousand, 10,000, a million people holding these coins. So in order to protect basically the protocol and, and the, the parsers, we're introducing a fee there, right? And, and the fee, it doesn't go to us. It's, it's master coins that get burned in the process. For each person that you send, you need to pay one willet, which is the, the equivalent of one Satoshi, it's the smallest unit of MasterCoin. 
this is an example of, of a use case where it makes technical sense. It's not something that any competitor can you know do without. So there there won't be any reason for our platform because of this fee. But they won't find a better a better deal than us. It's a use for Mastercoin. It's uh, something you know you have to have Mastercoins in order to use this particular feature. And this and other similar features will drive the use of Mastercoins themselves. You're actually burning MasterCoin when it comes to these fees. So nobody is being paid the fee, just the supply gets smaller. So it's kind of like you're increasing the value for everybody who's holding the token out there, right? Yes, exa exactly right. And, and you know, there, there is a lot of discussion internally on, you know, where should we charge these fees? Uh, you know, some people think that we should charge them you know, whenever we can to increase the price of MasterCoins. Others, myself included, think that, you know, we should only find the right places where there is a good technical reason for that, a technical excuse or a technical reason. And basically, when you have that technical foundation that really supports burning coins, then, you know, we don't have any, any concerns that a competing platform can, you know, outperform our skill, right? Because we're doing the best that we can possibly do. But still, while, you know, while we're being as open as possible, basically the, the mission statement of the Mastercoin Foundation is twofold. On the one hand, we want to build the platform, build the tools, build, build the source code, and make sure that it's as useful as possible. But on the other hand, we have a commitment to everybody who invested MasterCoin to really take care of the MasterCoin price, if you will, to make sure that the price doesn't drop to zero, but rather keeps increasing. So that's uh, sort of the balance that we're uh, working. My approach to this, I don't care what the MasterCoin price is right now, or in a week, or in, or in a month, or you know, even in three months. I care what the price of MasterCoin is in a year, in two years, in five years. I want to think big and, and long term. And, and this is you know, why I don't go in and check the, the price charts. Everybody who's been with Bitcoin for a while knows that this, you know, you know Bitcoin is, is hyper volatile and all these alts and derived currencies are even more volatile than that. Sure. Well, a lot of it has to do with, as yeah. you mentioned earlier, that uh, MasterCoin isn't traded on many exchanges because to this point, it's been very technically difficult for them to integrate it. Now that you have this singular way forward, um, do you think that that's going to change in the next couple of months or do you think that we're still looking towards the end of the year? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think that we will have, again, I, I don't want to commit here on air, but we should have about uh, at least one exchange that integrates MasterCoin within the next month and a half. That's something that you know we're working with, with several exchanges and we're giving them uh, the instructions and, and it's going to be really simple for them to integrate that. And, and you know, going forward, we're going to invest whatever resources we need, whatever time we need, and going to help these exchanges and take the feedback from them and integrate that into the core product. So I do, I do expect exchanges, more and more exchanges, to start integrating MasterCoin within the upcoming months. And I, I'm not going to make any, any predictions on the, on the price. So I have two questions. First, this is total non sequitur, but just wrapping up that last segment. You mentioned that the fee you'd be burning is one Willet. And that strikes me, if that's the equivalent of one Satoshi, that's actually a smaller amount of MasterCoin than you're able to send to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin has a dust limit. So is, that, is, is a dust limit not a problem with a token like MasterCoin, or is this just the starting point for that number? Well, that's actually a rather technical question there. Uh, the thing is, you know, when you send some token to, to 1,000 addresses or to 10,000 addresses, you will be burning 1,000 wallets or 10,000 wallets, right? It's one wallet per address that you're paying to, right? So it, it usually won't be just one wallet, it would be a lot of wallets. And then you still, you know, you still pay all the Bitcoin transaction fees that are required to encode that in the protocol. So there's no really use or fear spam here. You know, since you asked this question, I, I, maybe I can elaborate here a bit. The one wallet is, is more of a placeholder, right? The, the goal in my mind is to remove us from the decision making process on, you know, which fees on, and how many fees there will be. So right now we're, we're actually starting with this placeholder, one wallet per, per address, but the goal is to uh, modify the protocol itself so holders of MasterCoin will be able to vote on these, on these fees and directly change them. I don't want the votes to just, you know, come up uh, in a sort of way that, you know, we tally up the votes and we encode some new value into the protocol. But I want the voting mechanism to be an integral part of the protocol, where if people want to change the fee, the fee just changes. That's the future that we're headed towards. And we're just starting off with, with, with one, one wallet as a, as a starting point. 
what projects are coming up that our listeners would like to hear about? What are, what things are you excited about, uh, both in terms of new crowdfunding campaigns or just things that you're pretty sure you could talk about and that are going to happen over the next, you know, over the summer? What, what, are, we, what are we looking at? I actually don't want to speak a lot about you know the, the different projects because you know I'm, I'm more familiar with some of them, less familiar with, with others. Uh, you know we have we have a crowdfunding uh, page on on our wiki that lists all these you know upcoming crowd sales, and you know people can add their own there. And, uh, so you know I, I really don't want to focus on any particular one. I think that's uh, important for us as the foundation not to go recommending any particular crowd sales because that's not what we do, right? We, we just provide a platform. Uh, but I, I, I'm willing, I'm, I'm happy to talk about, you know, what we are doing. So we are, as I said before, we are uh, consolidating the work on the master core. We have our first alpha release, uh, you know, just last week. It's out there. People can compile that. People can play around with that. We're they are adding in support for, for more features over the next month and a half. And it, it should reach a beta stage uh, around August 1st and, and will be integrated with an exchange. After that, we're just going to take this as a starting point. You know, I, I finally, basically after this last a half a year where we were at the feature freeze, we will be able to really add on the features that are needed. And we're still having discussion you know, internally and with various platforms on which features are exactly needed at the protocol level. But you know, once we have that core client out there, then we can really start running and, and implementing these. So that's at the core project. Our web wallet is also you know, making great strides. It's been in sort of a test mode or an alpha mode for the last quarter. And you know, people have been using it in, in production, right? <laughs> when MateSafe was released, the client was still in alpha and it handled a few million dollars of, of transactions. But you know, we, are, we are making a lot of progress on that. We're gradu graduating that to beta level as well within the next week or two, I think. And following that, we still have a lot of UI improvements. I know that you know, our goal is really to simplify, simplify, simplify whatever we can on the usability of the product. And we want to make, really make the best web wallet that is accessible for Bitcoin, for MasterCoin, for all these use-generated currencies. And the next step, which I'm re really excited about, is actually integrating competing projects, or not, not even competing, just other projects and other protocols into the same wallet. So I, I want to have, uh, you know, colored coins, I want to have counterparty, I want to have Ethereum, I want to have Litecoin and Peercoin, all of them in the same in the same web wallet. I think it's, it's, it's ridiculous that people today need like five or 10 or 20 different wallets to just to hold all, all of their coins. So that, that's something that we'll, we'll put some effort on after August. Ron Gross, Executive Director of the MasterCoin Foundation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks for listening to episode 123 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's episode was provided by Adam B. Levine and Ron Gross. This episode was edited by Matthew Zipkin and produced by Adam B. Levine. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com and click the community menu item. You'll not only find our community forums, but the gateway to earning LTB coin. The coin that lets you sponsor Let's Talk Bitcoin for free. Just post, comment, share, enjoy, and each week you'll get your fair split based on how much you contributed compared against everybody else. For us to properly credit you, you'll need to be logged in and have a counterwallet.co address entered into your profile where it asks for a LTB coin compatible address. If you have any issues, the forums are a great place to go looking for help. Thanks for listening, and I'm really looking forward to continuing this experiment with you. Have a good one.